Well, well Chad, thanks so much uh, for the uh, invitation to speak and for the uh, very kind introduction. And thanks everybody for being here today. Um, for those of you who joined in the last minute or two, we were uh, kind of joking around earlier that you guys are uh, uh, joining us from a little, little, little chilly up in uh, up in, uh, sh in the Illinois area, Chicago area. Um, I am in South Beach uh, visiting my family. My mom got the uh, second dose of the uh, Moderna vaccine uh, in South Florida, so uh, came to uh, help with that. I got my second dose a couple weeks ago, so I'm um, sorry I can't be there in person, uh, but hopefully whatever this thing is is going to get better at some point. I don't know when, but at some point. Um, thanks to all of you guys. Um, I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, uh, have been on the front lines of this COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic challenge difficulty. I don't even, there's, there are no words to describe what, what most of us have been through, especially y'all uh, sitting in front of me. So um, thank you for doing what you're doing. Um, we're uh, going to be taking a little bit of a different approach to medicine um, today. When I went to medical school, uh, and then when I did my residency training, uh, the terms like prevention and Alzheimer's disease, like those terms like didn't exist. You know, that was like 15, 20 years ago. Um, I, uh, I, <laughs> I just never was trained about preventative uh, neurodegenerative diseases. It was just never something we learned about. Um, and then even in medical school and residency training and, and fellowship training, and even in career, we treat disease because that's the way our, our payment system is, is worked on. And that, that's just what, what we're trained on. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the future of medicine, I really believe uh, some people have called this medicine 3.0, that uh, preventative health, um, you know, thinking about lifespan, which is longevity, thinking about health span, meaning quality of life as we live, um, and thinking about brain span, brain span, and, you know, cognitive, you know, resiliency, and, and like, that's just not something we, we, we think about. So uh, I hope today you'll um, get a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, of, of a different uh, perspective on um on that type of medical care. So I will now um, share my screen if I can figure this out. Let me see here. Okay, cool. Great. And voila. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about a topic um, you probably haven't heard too much about, and that's um, Alzheimer's risk reduction um, and Alzheimer's prevention. And the <laughs> kind of specific uh, approach that we take is a very individualized approach. You know, we have Guidelines. Um, I remember um, during my medical internship, I did my medical internship actually at Mount Sinai Medical Center um, in, in Miami Beach, where I'm only about 10 minutes away from as we speak. Um, and, you know, I had my, you know, my pocketbooks and my Washington manual. And I had this one thing where it was like the 10 emergencies, like what to do. And then my patient came in and, you know, it was, it was, I don't want to say it was cookbook medicine, but it was, you know, a lot of algorithms that you absolutely needed to follow in a very regimented way. So you didn't miss anything, you followed the evidence, you followed the guidelines, and you, you know, took really good care of patients. That was our goal. Um, when it comes to Alzheimer's dementia and Alzheimer's, um, the, the key word here is individualized. And individualized is there's just not a one-size-fits-all approach to managing um, people with cognitive decline. And again, this is not something I learned about in medical school. I thought about, you know, Alzheimer's disease is this like very homogeneous disease. Um, and it's just not, it's, it's a very heterogeneous condition. And each person, when we're trying to optimize or you know, uh, maintain their cognitive health, uh, we need to intervene in a different way. So I think um, that's a good take home point. Um, when it comes to uh, my disclosures, um, you know, I've received a fair amount of grants, grant support from the NIH and the American Academy of Neurology. Um, the NIH actually clinical research loan repayment program, something I'd advocate for you to look into. Um, if you have loans, I had lots of loans. They paid off a little more than $100,000 in my loans. Um, got a lot of philanthropy when you do research that um, kind of is a little bit new. Um, you have to depend on um, uh, support from foundations, things like that. Um, and I'm a trustee of the McKnight Brain Research Foundation that studies cognitive aging. Uh, but by far, my, my number one disclosure or my number one bias that really changed the way I think about Alzheimer's disease and, and cognitive decline uh, is my uh, Uncle Bob, my dad's cousin, Charlotte. And um, this is a picture of my family back in uh, 1946 from Flatbush, Brooklyn. And four people in this picture um, ended up having Alzheimer's disease. So I've seen Alzheimer's disease literally um, like since I was this big. Uh, my uncle, my great uncle Max uh, was diagnosed in 1980 and I was three at the time. And like, I remember that. I remember him staring out of windows and he was like, you know, they called him senile and that was just normal as we age. And we know that Senility is not normal and it is not normal. And senility, I don't even know what senility is, it's a disease. It's an actually pathological condition. And I've seen these uh, family members um, decline over time. 
And what I didn't realize at the time is that Alzheimer's disease actually begins in the brain over 20 years before the first symptoms. So um, that's, that's striking, just like you have a heart attack or a stroke. It's not like it happens immediately if it's, you know, it's ischemic over time. Well, same thing with Alzheimer's, it's a decade long disease. So this is my uncle Bob, he was age 31. He had no symptoms, no pathology, he's normal. And someone like that, we're gonna talk about primary prevention of Alzheimer's. But you know, in stage one of Alzheimer's, the disease starts silently in the brain, but no symptoms. That's preclinical, pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's can be in your 40s and have pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's. Then when you start having those senior moments, that's what he was diagnosed with. Oh, he's fine, you see you later, doing fine. Well, no, he's not fine. He had mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease. And then finally, when he can no longer take care of himself at the age of 72, he was diagnosed with the magic word of dementia. Well, dementia just means he can't take care of himself, but he's had Alzheimer's disease and he had it for 20 to 30 years. So the way I look at this condition is that if at age 85, 45% of Alzheimer's, and that's a lot. It's not 100%, but it's uh, you know in the 40, 40 something percent. That means the disease first started in their brains between the ages of 55 and 65. But if at age 65, right, 10% of people had Alzheimer's, that means the disease first started between their ages of 35 and 45. And like that's that's where I am. I'm in that I'm in that age category, and I really don't want to get Alzheimer's dementia. I want to do something about it. So if the disease starts early, what can we do about it? And what, what, what is and what is not in our control? 46 million Americans, big number here, 46 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease beginning in their brains, but no symptoms yet. And that's, uh, that's a striking thing that most people don't realize. So when it comes to this, this topic, well, what, what can you do about Alzheimer's prevention? Like how, how do you even go about that? I don't even understand what, what that is. Well, several randomized controlled trials um, have now shown uh, cognitive benefits from risk factor modification. And we'll talk about what those risk factors are. Uh, there's a study called the finger study that used uh, certain types of diet interventions, along with exercise interventions, along with um, cognitive training, plus a regular follow-up by a uh, internal medicine uh, clinician. And that's, that's uh, just a two-year study. And a two-year study showed that people that followed this multimodal you know, lifestyle-based, you know, managing your blood pressure, managing your cholesterol, exercising and diet, simple things that, you know, all of us should be doing, uh, but, you know, maybe some of us don't realize they're tied to brain function. In a two-year study uh, showed um, really that you can delay cognitive decline, and that's that's pretty impactful. There are a variety of other studies. Um, the Sprint Mind trial that's listed here at the bottom is probably the most impactful study that's been published, uh, in, in my opinion, in our, in our field. Uh, in the last couple of years. Um, this is a, a study published in JAMA. On, in a, it's, a, it's a blood pressure study, right? They looked at what is the most optimal blood pressure uh, for cognition. And this was a randomized study for three years. They treated people with the kind of the usual-ish 140s over 80s uh, blood pressure target. And then they had a more aggressive or comprehensive um, care arm where they took people that that had high blood pressure, but they really tried to get their blood pressure in the 120s over 70s or lower. And just with three years of more tight blood pressure control, they were able to delay the likelihood of, or reduce the likelihood of a person developing the earliest symptoms of cognitive decline called mild cognitive impairment by 19%, right? So you add, wow, 19%, just one intervention. So you add that plus all these different other interventions and we can really, you know, I really believe move the needle. Um, so back in 2013, we started a program called the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic. It was uh, very new at the time, and now there's um, a kind of several uh, that have popped up all over the country. Um, and what exactly do we do? Well, we apply the best available evidence. Uh, we ground it in safety, because the last thing we need to do is try to prevent someone's Alzheimer's disease and do something that's going to cause them harm when we don't know for sure they're going to get Alzheimer's disease. The other critical part point here is that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, this individualized approach is key. Mr. Jones is going to get, you know, 16 different things based on his specific risk factors and, and whatnot. Mrs. Smith, totally different. She's going to get 11 different things based on her individual risk factors. So again, the key here is Alzheimer's is not a um, heterogeneous disease. It's not exactly an algorithm, and we really have to get down into the, the, the details I believe, to truly have the most benefit. And we'll talk about a concept uh, soon called uh, precision medicine and how we apply this to clinical care. So when it comes to risk factor assessments, well, there's things we can change and there's things we can't. So uh, we have age, family history, past medical problems, level of education, 
past head trauma. And these are things that we, you know, can't change, but really indicate that there could be something or increase a person's risk of cognitive decline later. When it comes to modifiable, <coughs> excuse me, risk factors, these are things that are under our control. Easy stuff, exercise, dietary patterns, but the devil is in the details. You can't just say, tell someone to go eat a healthy diet. Well, different people probably need different dietary patterns, and that's a whole different discussion. The NIH actually just had their first ever NIH Precision Nutrition Conference. I was very humbled to speak at a couple of weeks ago, and they're actually, um, NIH is investing a huge amount of money and, and, and time into the first really, you know, major uh, initiative to research precision nutrition. What should some people eat? What should other people eat? And, and figuring that out based on the individual person. Uh, so there is a big science here. It's not just, you know, go eat a magic blueberry and you're going to like, you know, prevent Alzheimer's. Well, it doesn't work that way. We should give different people different things based on their individual biology. Uh, when it comes to cognitive engagement, keeping the brain active, excuse me, sleep patterns, musical activity, social engagement, and stress reduction, these are all things that are really critical. And, you know, I didn't really learn any of this in, in medical school or in residency, like literally none of this stuff. Um, when it comes to cardiovascular disease risk, um, if there's one thing that you take home from today about protecting a person's risk of cognitive decline, uh, that is... Uh, vascular risk factor modification, blood pressure control, diabetes, tobacco. Um, these are all things that absolutely um, relate to cognitive decline. Also, uh, you know, people with diabetes, as an example, people with diabetes actually have a twofold likelihood of developing <laughs> Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> so um, let's see. Oh, Chad was just saying, if you didn't catch it at the beginning, there's a CME code. Okay. I thought that was a question. By the way, if you have questions for me during the activity, just you can raise your hand. I can probably see you. Um, you can chat, type it in the chat, or we can, of course, take uh, questions at the end. And I'm going to try to leave at least uh, 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Uh, so don't worry about that. Okay. So what do we do with all this evidence? Well, we try to take evidence from clinical trials, randomized cl controlled clinical trials. We take evidence from strong epidemiological research. And we do the best we can with applying it to clinical care. And then when we do this, and we have this milieu of interventions, we have something called a paradigm called comparative effectiveness research, where we um, actually take the ex existing res uh, interventions that exist for risk reduction, and then we try to implement it in clinical care and clinical practice. I'm a clinician researcher. And then we put people's data in a registry, and then we can do research on it. So that's what I do. Um, I don't do randomized trials. I don't um, you know, um, you know, plan clinical trials that uh, randomize one person to eat this and one person to eat that. I'm gonna actually try to do um, kind of a phase four approach to research, which is comparative effectiveness research, where we take what's proven and do it in clinic and then try to assess the outcomes of our recommendations in real world clinical practice. Um, how do we apply the, this care? Well, we use a concept called uh, precision medicine. And precision medicine is something you may have heard of and, and you may have a, a picture of, of it in your mind with you know, all these fancy genetics and fancy metabolomics and proteomics and all these like fancy stuff. But you know, it, it's, it's actually not, it doesn't even have to be that fancy. Um, the NIH defines precision medicine as an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention, taking into account the person's individual variability in genes, their environment, and their lifestyle. So again, um, we can individualize care. I mean, a lot of us do, do this stuff all the time in clinic and, and even, even on the wards, we individualize care based on the person. But there are um, you know, emerging principles of precision medicine that about a lot of us really don't use. And that's, for example, genetics. All of our patients get their genes tested. And if they have, for just one example, a copy of the apolipoprotein gene where they have a four variant, they're going to get one set of recommendations as opposed to a different set of re recommendations if they don't. So we're going to take their medical history, their lifestyle patterns, their anthropometrics, meaning their, their body fat percentages, where the body fat is, is it visceral fat, is it somewhere else, um, what their muscle mass is, what their genetics are, what their cholesterol, inflammation, metabolism, nutritional blood biomarkers, and also their baseline cognitive function. We're going to take all of these and inform a multimodal management plan. And this is the schematic that we use to, uh, to think about this. I don't think many uh, of you in the room have ever maybe, maybe put together the link of, wait a minute, as the belly size gets larger, the waist circumference gets larger, the memory center or the hippocampus in the brain gets smaller. 
again, I never learned any of that. I never even like thought about that. And for example, women, women that that have abdominal obesity, visceral fat um, over a certain level have a 39% higher likelihood of having dementia. Again, these are things I just never learned about. A metabolic syndrome, of course I learned about. Diabetes, of course, but the effects of these conditions on the brain um, is something that in uh, you know 2021 and beyond is something I think all of us uh, are gonna be focusing more on. Um, I talked about the different blood-based biomarkers, the ABCs of Alzheimer's prevention management, where we take anthropometrics, blood-based biomarkers and cognition. And using these baseline assessments, we can then target a multimodal management plan. Um, what are our interventions? Well, I kind of talked about this already. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit in more detail about the nutrition and the exercise and a little bit on music. Um, it goes without saying that regular follow-up with a, with a primary care physician for a modification of cardiovascular risk factors is, is honestly a, about the most important thing that, that a person can do to, to protect their brain health over time. I think exercise and nutrition are, are close, uh, but, but regular follow-up with cardiovascular disease risk factor modification is critical. Um, and at the bottom here, we're gonna talk about education. So um, it's uh, very hard, I would say immensely challenging to have the time to talk to patients about all this stuff. So we've actually um, uh, tried to help uh, in, in, in this uh, matter for physicians. And we, we have online coursework, uh, free online coursework uh, about uh, risk reduction for uh, Alzheimer's disease that your patients can use. We actually also have a CME course online for doctors. We have coursework for medical students, college students, um, high school students, actually Seth Rogen, uh, the comedic actor, actually um, basically put my lab coat on and taught the classes for the high school and college students um, and even the medical students and the neurology residents. So if you want to uh, learn about brain health and also get a couple of jokes along the way, you can uh, check this out. And that's that website that uh, I mentioned earlier, alzu.org.org. And we'll talk about that at the end. Um, so if you want to get complicated, um, this is what we really do. Um, we take the individual biomarkers and then we um, link it to an intervention. Basically a lot of if this, then this, if that, then that. And this is a really busy slide, so I can't go through all the decision trees, but if you are interested in learning more about this, uh, we published uh, several articles in the journal Alzheimer's and Dementia, uh, the journal of the Alzheimer's Association, where we go into the methods about how we do this, and then the results of, of when you do this, what happens after 18 months. And if you wanna learn this in a, a kind of a, a quicker phase, you know, in an hour uh, online, uh, the alzu.org has, a, again, a free uh, CME course for physicians. When it comes to nutrition and Alzheimer's, um, I could literally spend an entire talk on nutrition and Alzheimer's disease. Um, the fact that um, you know his, uh, you know this 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 uh, you know you, you Google uh, nutrition and, and, and Alzheimer's uh, diet and Alzheimer's, and you go into PubMed a decade ago, and you get you know thirty to forty articles, and now you search for the same terms, you hit over three thousand articles. Okay, that's not a joke. Over three thousand. The evidence around nutrition has literally been exponential. Um, and I really believe that, that there's sufficient evidence. And I really believe that we need to um, you know, do something um, uh, and counsel our patients about getting help with nutrition. Now, how much time do we have to teach them? Where do we, where do we tell them to go? These are challenging questions. But Mediterranean style diet by far has the most evidence. Um, ketogenic diet has a lot of interesting um, emerging evidence. Um, caloric restriction, the less you eat, the better your brain health is. You know, it's been shown uh, for, for studies now over the last, you know, five, five to seven years. When it comes to single and multi-nutrients, it's not just about the dietary pattern, but it's about the individual components. Again, things I never really learned about um, in, in, in any of my medical training. Omega-3 fatty acids, well, well, what are they? What are the difference? There's ALA, there's DHA, and there's EPA. And, you know, chia seeds and flax seeds have omega-3s. They're healthy for the brain, right? No, not really. Um, there's really no great evidence that ALA, which is a type of omega-3 and chia seeds and flax seeds really have that much benefit. So are they unhealthy? No. Are they brain healthy? I don't know. I really think so. But DHA and EPA clearly are. But different people with different genes need different amounts of DHA and EPA. So the devil is in the details here. And, you know, um, again, I could spend an entire hour on, uh, on nutrition. Um, but it's just just know that this is only scratching the surface. Uh, curcumin, turmeric, um, this is available in, in different types of supplements. I have nothing to disclose. I don't have any uh, funding for or, or take any compensation from any uh, nutrition or vitamin or supplement companies. But curcumin, there's studies that a randomized study that shows that you know you can delay uh, amyloid depositions by taking a specific uh, form of curcumin. And these are things that 
you know, I, I never really thought to use supplements and vitamins in, in my training, but there's a few, there's a handful for brain health that I, I do recommend in the right situation. Uh, B-complex vitamins, we're going to talk about those shortly because in some people, they're going to slow memory loss and other people, they don't do anything. Again, individualizing care. Vitamin D, caffeine, dietary antioxidants. There's a lot of these little uh, devil in the details things that we'll talk about. Um, when it comes to Mediterranean style diet, I think you all are pretty familiar with this. Plant derived foods, fresh fruit are the primary source of carbohydrates. Uh, green leafy vegetables are probably the most brain healthy uh, thing that you, can, that you can get when it comes to carbohydrates. Um, olive oil is uh, kind of like miracle grow for the, for the brain, um, uh, extra virgin olive oil specifically. Also note that uh, over 60% of olive oil that's bought in the stores in, in the one study is adulterated, meaning it's not what it actually says it is. Uh, and you really have to read the labels, um, read the labels. Um, and, you know, you cook with it, you put it on your salad. These are, these are, you know, important things that change the structure, the chemical structure, and um, really affect how brain healthy um, the, the um, nutrient is. When it comes to fish, um, fatty fish like lake trout, mackerel, herring, albacore tuna, and especially wild salmon, at least once or twice a week, these are things that, you know, are protective on the brain. And it's, it's, uh, some people don't like fish, so maybe they need omega-3 fatty acid supplements. And these are the confusing parts of, of, uh, of this sort of approach. Um, minimizing red meat, um, you know, wine in low to moderate amounts. These are all um, parts of the Mediterranean style diet. Uh, dietary ketosis in a six week study. I think a lot of people think about diet and you have to change your diet for like a whole lifetime. And thus you're just not gonna really you know, spend time counseling because you don't know that it's realistic that patients will do that. This is a study that within six weeks of a very low carbohydrate diet, uh, people didn't just improve their weight and, and reduce their waist circumference. They actually improved their memory. Again, these are things that are concepts that are pretty new. Um, okay, I'll keep going. So the finger study was a study I mentioned earlier where we uh, integrated all of these different things together. Um, and basically we um, uh, used a specific diet. Um, is this the right diet? What is the most brain healthy diet? I don't know that we know that. And I still don't even know that a one size fits all diet is really the right approach. But these are the types of um, dietary patterns the finger study used uh, with, with actually terrific success. When it comes to fish oil, like I said earlier, um, not all fish oil is created equal. I think some people don't even realize that, you know, that fish oil is a supplement. Supplements don't work. That's kind of like what most people think. And I don't disagree or agree with that. I think it just depends on which supplement. Omega-3 fatty acids are FDA approved for cholesterol management. You know, Lovasa, for example, the new um, uh, Vesipa. Vesipa is also FDA approved. It's just an omega-3 fatty acid. It's the same thing, but it was studied in multiple randomized trials. So it reaches... FDA approval level. Again, these may work uh, preferentially depending on a person's genes. If anyone in the audience wants to um, learn every single thing they ever wanted to learn about omega-3 fatty acids um, also and about their relationship to the brain, um, there's a guy named Peter Atia, A-T-T-I-A. -T -T he has a podcast and he interviewed the guru on this stuff, um, Hussein Yazin, on Monday, on February 1st. So if you really want a deeper dive on any of this stuff, uh, the, the truth is out there. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, information on this. Um, it may put you to sleep. Um, I made it through about, I love Hussein. He's, a, he's amazing and I love Peter. But uh, after about 25 minutes, I needed to put it to rest. My brain became yellow and it was really complicated stuff. Again, if you want to learn more, uh, the information is out there. When it comes to B vitamins, um, yeah, like a decade ago, 15 years ago, I never thought I'd ever be giving a presentation or a talk or a I don't know, of, of the grand rounds, especially at a different, in a different state that I was in and talking about B vitamins that, that I never thought that would happen. But the Vitacog studies are, were multiple randomized controlled trials that showed that when people had mild memory loss and people had elevated homocysteines in their, in their blood, those people, when given B complex vitamins had slower brain shrinkage, brain atrophy and improved scores on memory testing. But when people already had dementia due to Alzheimer's, B-complex vitamins have no effect. So again, it's not just about when to use it, it's about in who to use it. And these people, only, only the only people that benefit are people that have high homocysteines. Then they took it one step further and the only people that benefited to the, to the maximal amount also had uh, adequate amounts of omega-3 fatty acids in the, in the blood too. So again, there's this precision nutrition, precision medicine component, and I think this is where our field is going. Uh, wake up and smell the coffee. That means there's less than 10 minutes left, so that's good. And then again, we'll open it um, up for questions. 
uh, caffeinated coffee, especially earlier in the day, is probably beneficial. Caffeine has a half-life of at least six or so hours. So uh, I understand for uh, residents uh, who are working um, ridiculous hours, you can have coffee uh, anytime you want. That's okay. Um, I never even drank coffee till residency, and now I drink um, tons of it. Uh, brain health is uh, impacted in a positive way by caffeinated coffee, but drinking coffee too late in the day is going to mess mess up or interfere with sleep wake cycle. So again, the devil is in the details. Coffee good earlier in the day is. When it comes to um, um, sort of other things like blueberries and strawberries, the nurse's health study showed that regular intake of blueberries and strawberries, that means a half a cup at least two to three times a week, uh, was shown to have a delay in cognitive decline for over two years. Um, that's pretty impressive. Uh, Coca flavanols also. Um, this is a, a supplement, again, nothing to disclose, called Cocovia. They've done multiple randomized controlled trials, not just improving memory function, but also blood pressure control and insulin resistance. So. Purified cocoa flavanols, um, I think, really have a role uh, when it comes to brain health and even cardiovascular health. But it's not those chocolate bars, you know, Hershey's bars. They, I love Hershey's bars, actually. But, um, you know, try to have half of one when I do get them because um, I know try not to have the whole thing. It's very difficult. But it's all sugar and butter and sugar and butter and then, like, you know, a little sprinkle of, of, of cocoa in there. So, again, devil is in the details. So where we're going is we're trying to figure out how a brain healthy diet in, differs from a heart healthy and an overall healthy diet in diverse subpopulations. And that's maybe uh, five-ish or more years away, maybe seven. Um, when it comes to amyloid, we've learned about Alzheimer's and we learned about amyloid is that bad protein that gets gunked up in the brain. Uh, and guess what happens? The more we exercise, the more we move, in mice and then in humans, finally, uh, the lower the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So your uh, little mouse guy gets on the barbells and gets on the treadmill. And that's a direct way that anyone today, if they want to reduce amyloid in their brain today, can actually um, uh, do that through exercise. Uh, musical activity is something that um, I think has gotten a lot of attention, um, but something that I really um, uh, think needs to get even more attention. And that's keeping the brain active using musical training. Intensive musical training, even late in life, can improve cognitive function. And obviously, I've learned about this. I have a family history. I got excited and I joined a rock band where the Regenerates, uh, Music for the Right Brain, a bunch of uh, dorky neurologists, neuroscientists. We even have an anesthesiologist who's our drummer. He's the least dorky of the bunch. Um, but uh, we, uh, we play music and I, I think it's good for our brain, but it's also fun too. Okay, stress. Stress is something that I, I was wrong about. I thought stress, come on, just be tough, stick it out, you know, be tough, you can do this, you know, but no, 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 stress is bad. Stress is bad and it promotes brain aging. Okay, wellness is critical. Stress is bad. And specifically the part of stress that's the worst is rumination, neuroticism. When someone worries and thinks about over and over and over, unconstructive, repetitive thoughts, not only does it decrease performance on cognitive testing, but within the last year, the first study actually showed that it, it specifically correlates, as opposed to other psychiatric symptoms, with amyloid deposition. Like, so shut it off, whatever way we got to do it, whether it's mindfulness-based stress reduction or meditation or taking deep breaths or taking a long weekend, whatever it is, you got to do it because it has a really bad effect on your brain. Social interaction, more Facebook friends, bigger brains. Google it, the study that actually showed that. Um, keep engaged, whether it's through social media, I don't know, actually social media nowadays, I think it maybe makes brains, I don't know, doesn't probably have too, the best of effect on brains, but a lot of stuff going on around on social media, but um, social interaction. Uh, this guy named Sanjay Gupta, Dr. Dr. Gupta is uh, the CNN uh, correspondent, neurosurgeon, just wrote a book called Keep Sharp. I got to interview him uh, last week on Med, uh, medscape.com, a site I did this little column for. And he, uh, he, he told me something uh, and he said it, he said, uh, take a brisk walk with a close friend and talk about your problems. And that was a really um, good little recommendation anecdote because when you take a brisk walk, you get the blood flowing, you stimulate the BDNF, you uh, go with a friend because obviously that's social interaction and then talking about your problems, it's a really great way to de-stress. So whatever way you can um, advocate for your patients to uh, do this is really critical. So with that, we took all of these concepts, we took all of these randomized controlled trials and we said, you know what, we're doctors. It's great that we have these randomized trials, but we have to like, you know, tell our patients to do stuff. And we created a, um, a clinical 
a, a clinical research study looking at how to manage patients in an Alzheimer's prevention clinic. We published this uh, last year. Uh, we actually recruited patients between the ages of 25 and 86. Nope, that's not a typo. 25 to 86, our average age was 51. And we basically tried to prevent their cognitive decline. And um, what we did is we, instead of using a dose of a medication, we did different compliance groups. So people were in the higher compliance, lower compliance groups. And then instead of having a control group, because we're a clinic, you know, we take insurance, we treat people. Um, we actually used aged and sex matched historical controls from different data sets, you know, um, over 40,000 people that basically were followed over 18 months with cognitive testing, the same tests, but with given no interventions. Now, this is not a perfect study. This is like by far not a gold standard randomized yada, 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 but it's real world clinical practice. So this is our goal to see how risk factor modification in real world clinical practice, does it translate um, what are the outcomes? So what were our outcomes? Our outcomes were um, cognitive function based on a scale where even though a person doesn't have symptoms related to dementia or, or real true Alzheimer's cognitive decline, you can actually see detect subtle changes in cognitive function before the onset of symptoms. And this was a scale uh, that we used called the Modified Alzheimer's Prevention Cognitive Composite. We also looked at risk scales of Alzheimer's disease and cardiovascular risk, and then a bunch of biomarkers like LDL, hemoglobin A1C. So in brief, what we showed is that in people that had no symptoms at all, it didn't matter if people followed greater than 60% or less than 60 questions. These were the, uh, the little blue dot, blue circle here and the um, yellow box over here. Regardless if they followed more or less of the suggestions at 18 months, they were still able to optimize their cognition. However, this was over here is the people with mild cognitive impairment, the, and this is people with amyloid in their brain, but with, you know, still able to take care of themselves. These people were working, these people were doing, you know, all the usual things. It took them this is people that followed greater than 60% of the recommendations. On average, we gave people 21 different recommendations. And that means these people followed greater than 60%. Within six months, they weren't really improving, but it took them a year to a year and a half to show that statistically significant improvements over people with mild cognitive impairment that uh, did not follow uh, the 60% or, or of the recommendation. So this study showed that it is possible to optimize cognitive function when people um, really get individualized care in the clinic. The other uh, uh, aspects that we showed was that we had significant improvements on risk scales. And sorry, this, uh, scale, this uh, slide is very small, um, but long story short, um, all of our risk scales from uh, cardiovascular disease risk scales, uh, for example, the um, the MESA uh, score, which I really like a lot. Uh, also the AHA um, uh, risk scale, we, we use American Cardi Cardiology AHA uh, scale. So basically on all of the risk scales um, also improve uh, over time. And uh, in summary, this was the first uh, empirical trial in a clinical setting, that's the take home point here. This is a clinical research comparative effectiveness study showing that individualized Alzheimer's risk factor modification may improve cognitive function related to Alzheimer's pathology. Uh, and then when we did secondary analyses, we were able to show improvements in calculated risk. So I believe from this work um, that, um, first of all, prevention is critical because this stuff happens uh, decades, literally. Alzheimer's begins in the brain 20 to 30 years before the first symptom of memory loss. So from a practical clinical perspective, using this type of multi-domain individualized care uh, can truly be applied to the tens of millions of people out there over, you know, with 46 million Americans with preclinical Alzheimer's and, you know, at least 10 million people probably with mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's. I don't exactly know the numbers specifically there. Um, you know, over 50 million people at a minimum um, are at risk for dementia. So what we need to do next is study it in a large uh, multi-site study. Uh, we were well on our way doing that, grants going in, everything was great. And then uh, COVID hit. So uh, things have been uh, on hold and we're now um, kind of regrouping, two, two sites dropped out, getting new sites in, and hopefully we'll be able to study this through a multi-site international telemedicine-based study, uh, because uh, that's kind of the direction we've decided to go with things um, due to COVID. So with that, I will conclude, um, and then I'll end with, if you wanna learn more about um, Alzheimer's risk reduction, if you wanna learn more about kind of some of the brain healthy stuff uh, here and if you want to learn about all the um, you know the the evidence as well as the disconfirming evidence, not all the studies out there are positive. There's a lot, a lot of devil in the details here. 
uh, but if you are interested in learning more, um, you can take any one of these courses at alsu.org. Uh, this is that course. So these are our neurology residents. I was a residency director for uh, over a dozen years, first at University of Miami and then at Cornell. These are our neurology residents. Uh, actually, she snuck in. She's a she was a medical student, ended up going into surgery, and she's a PharmD who's awesome. Uh, she was my neighbor. They just wanted to meet Seth Rogen, so they uh, kind of snuck in and, and uh, saw uh, Seth and his dog Zelda um, teach. If you want to learn a deeper dive, uh, really for physicians, you know, clinicians that are going to be having their boots on the ground, the healthcare providers CME course I think is great, and then the prevention courses for your patients. So if you are having a patient that wants to learn more, um, you can send them out to the prevention course uh, and uh, you can do that. Okay, so with that, I will um, conclude and I am uh, happy to uh, take questions. Thanks a lot, Dr. Isaacson. I think there's one question from our uh, geriatric specialist, Dr. Trantafilo. Uh, he's asking any use if natural language uh, recognition in call ins is recorded to identify cases to refer cases. I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely do. Okay, so there was a, um, th and thanks for that comment. <laughs> Yeah, so there was a, a uh, an article in the New York Times, I believe, that was sent to me by multiple people a couple of days ago. And um, uh, yes, so natural language processing called NLP or natural language recognition or speech recognition or whatever term you want to use, it basically depends on if you're using a computer to do it or um, you know an algorithm to do it. There's different ways to, to process speech. So let me start with a story and then I'll um, give you a more uh, direct answer to your question. So there was a study called the Nun Study uh, that was actually outside of Chicago. And uh, I believe David Bennett from Rush is the person that um, uh, did uh, is a PI on that. And they took um, uh, nuns and they followed them throughout their, their lives. And in their teens, in their late teens, nuns had to write uh, like an autobiographical sketch about themselves. And then they basically went back you know, 50, 60 years later, whatever it was. And they looked at how that autobiographical sketch was written, the word complexity, the choice of, the choice of words, um, the sentence structure, things like that. And they were actually able to predict which nuns were gonna develop dementia based on their writing samples at 18 years old. And, you know, that is like, what the heck? Like, that's amazing, right? Well, well no, but it makes sense because the brain is you know wired in a very specific way and these risk factors based on early life education and based on a change over time in, 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 in how a person speaks the their word choice also the cadence of their speech the rhythm the timing are they you know missing a word are they doing something called circumlocution where they miss a word and then they have to dance around it you know the thing that they, they used to fix my hair oh the comb right these are you know Asia aspects and things like that. So natural language processing is a technique used to either listen to speech, verbal speech, or analyze written typed uh, or, or written language even with, with a handwriting example. So, so yes, um, I just literally replied to a colleague of mine about this two days ago and I said, um, in the future, um, we are going to be doing cognitive assessments online using cognitive tests um, you know, that, that are done via computer rather than, you know, done in a clinic. In the future, we're going to be doing um, voice assessments. We're going to be doing writing assessments with this, uh, this uh, thing called the digital pen, a really, really great work out of, uh, out of, out of a Framingham study, um, Rhonda, Rhoda Al, who's doing stuff like this. So, so I really believe that we're going to be digitizing and using digital um, biomarkers uh, from speech, language, vision, um, and we're actually already using it now for research. Um, one of the things that Chad mentioned earlier is, um, you can see this, but this is our, our wrist biosensor. It's uh, called WHOOP, W-H-O-O-P. Again, I have nothing to disclose. Um, we have to buy the devices ourselves and you know, still pay for them and stuff. But we um, can use um, you know, biosensor information uh, that collects cardiovascular metrics, that collect um, uh, basically sleep metrics. And, and we uh, actually had a bioinformatics uh, resident who became a fellow who uh, did some sort of k-means clustering i have no idea what to basically take the biometric information collected in, in this device to pre 
predict a person's cognitive function the next morning. So these are things that um, you know sound uh, you know like science fiction, but I, I really think medicine and dentistry help us go that way. Um, I see another question uh, from uh, Michael Malone. Thanks for asking. Um, if you were designing a Medicare Advantage benefits program, how would you frame those benefits to, to promote uh, promote healthy brain aging? Uh, boy, um, huh? This is um, I, so. I would. Um, how would I frame the program? I would would basically frame it as anything is better than nothing. Um, even walking is better than um, you know sitting in a chair all day. Um, using a standing desk is better than sitting in a but um, you know, trying to scale up um, you know, activity as best as the person can do um, and basically prioritizing the different domains and, and, and putting cardiovascular health, exercise, and nutrition as the three things that are, that are probably the most um, important. Uh, I'm not entirely clear how Medicare Advantage benefits programs work, um, but um, I would basically put things in a, in a priority order. I would um, try to communicate in a way that um, you know, patients um, could understand. And, um, you know, in an ideal world, um, if this is tied to insurance premiums, I'm not sure how exactly this, this would work. But if, you know, a person just like, you know, different, um, you know, employers out there, uh, you know, give Fitbits out. And when people have an average of 10,000 steps per day or more, um, or whatever that magic number is, they have a, a deduction on their health insurance um, uh, costs. Um, I think there's a lot of creative ways to do this. So hopefully I answered your question, but that was, um, that was an excellent question. Um, how does the device with metrics taken work? How long does it last? What are the proteins or transcription, trans, transcription factors looked at? Um, so the device that we use in our program just looks actually at um, exercise um, a strain, meaning um, when the heart rate is elevated, what the average pulse is, what their max pulses, what a person's heart rate variability is. We also look uh, at this device with uh, sleep patterns, what is the total sleep, uh, and then, you know, vague, non-imperfect uh, estimates of REM sleep and uh, deep sleep. REM sleep uh, actually um, uh, correlates with uh, how well a person consolidates memories uh, for the next day. Deep sleep is when amyloid, the amyloid disposal system is at work. The garbage trucks basically go in and dump out the amyloid. So deep sleep is the cleansing part of sleep. So um, that's what we look at specifically. We don't look at anything deeper um, in terms of uh, transcription factors or anything like that. Um, next question, what has been the role of genetic testing for referrals into the clinic? So all of our patients um, are offered genetic testing um, in the clinic. Uh, we do have lots of people that come into the clinic um, already getting their um, uh, genetics checked from 23andMe and other sites. So we do have a lot of people that know their ApoE4 uh, variant status um, when they come in. Um, we basically offer genetic testing for everyone. I basically think we're at a 98% yes rate. Um, about 10% of those people don't want to know what the answer is, but allow us to look at it to inform um, our, our management plan a little bit better. Um, but I do, you know, do I think that we should genetically test people and then, you know, people with two ApoE4 variants, should, should those people come into the clinic because they're at higher risk? I think that um, genetics is only one small part of the Alzheimer's risk puzzle. Um, I think having a family history of Alzheimer's, multiple family members, plus having the ApoE4 variant is a totally different person than a person that has two, two ApoE4 variants that doesn't have any family members with Alzheimer's. I literally saw a patient, at, I'm on vacation this week, but I saw a patient as an add-on this morning at 11. He has a 4-4 and he found out his stuff and he's freaking out. And like, he has no family members with Alzheimer's. Like he, you know, his doctor referred him in and like, he sh really shouldn't have been in the clinic in the first place. So um, genetics are, are, you know, the genes that we check for are risk genes. They're not deterministic genes. <laughs> Um, okay, lots of questions. Um, any thoughts on COVID-19 immunizations and preventative care in the clinic? Um, I got this question from a Wall Street Journal reporter the other day, so I did do some research on this, and uh, she decided not to report on it yet because the information was a little unclear. Um, this is how I'll answer it briefly. Um, can certain viruses trigger Alzheimer's pathology or fast forward it? I would say yes. Herpes virus and HIV both have direct effects on amyloid. Do other viruses like coronaviruses and, and, and flu viruses trigger Alzheimer's pathology? I have no idea. Does it impact vascular health? Yes. Does it have anything to do with Alzheimer's? Does it just fast forward? Does it cause? I, I'm, I'm not 
super worried at this time about COVID-19, you know, creating an, an Alzheimer's avalanche or something like that. But there are there are studies out there that show that people that are vaccinated at higher rates for flu for the flu and also pneumonia um, have lower um, likelihood of developing or, or being diagnosed with Alzheimer's later. So all I can say is I don't know all the answers, but this is going to be a very interesting um, uh, field of study. Uh, and then uh, last question, I'm happy to open it up to verbal questions too. Any interventions in clinic and caregiver burnout? Oh, boy, um, if I had um, a few extra people and, and extra time, I, I really should, and we all should, from time with, with trying to assess interventions in caregiver burnout. Um, uh, you know, the, the caregiver oftentimes uh, gets sick and passes away from some sort of medical condition for the patient with Alzheimer's because caring for a person with Alzheimer's is like a 24-7 job that is thankless and almost impossible, especially if people don't have help. So um, while we don't specifically uh, focus on this, I think um, caring for the caregiver um, is really important. Um, next question, any thoughts about Alzheimer's and hallucinations? How do you manage possibly differently than others? Great question. Um, so um, basically the FDA is currently reviewing um, a drug called Nuplazid. Nuplazid, the trade name is Nuplazid. Um, I'm sorry, the generic name is Pimavanserin. The trade name is Nuplazid. Um, and this is a, a drug that works on the 5-HT2 or 7, I'm forgetting, serotonin something system. And it's specifically um, being, been studied in, in um, dementia-related psychosis, DRP. Dementia-related psychosis is a condition that's associated with Parkinson's, with Alzheimer's, with a couple of other conditions that where a person hallucinates or has fixed delusions. Uh, this specific drug is being reviewed by the FDA. It's a study called the Harmony Trial. It's available now to be used off-label. It's only currently used for um, Parkinson's disease dementia because it's FDA approved, but Nuplazid will probably be approved by the FDA within the coming months. Um, that would be my, um, my, 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 my prediction there. Um, currently, how do we deal with hallucinations and people with Alzheimer's? Number one, we treat their Alzheimer's. Um, make sure that they're currently on um, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors um, and then add on nemantine later. I always put them on a decomposed vitamin to make the cholinesterase inhibitors work a little better. We make sure the cholinesterase inhibitors are given with breakfast or lunch, whichever meal is larger. Um, start low and go slow. When you give it at night, it can cause some vivid dreams and nightmares, which can be confused with hallucinations. So I always treat first line with the cholinesterase inhibitors and then and then the mantine and then i add on a low dose ssri you know, lex lexapros escitalopram is the one i use based on a variety of work five to ten milligrams or so and then if all that doesn't help um, i will then um, potentially use a very tiny dose um, seroquel quetiapine which is off label uh, but it definitely takes the edge off for some benefits that can be documented but within a few months from now uh, pima vanserin is probably going to be the, the the first approved drug for dementia related psychosis uh, awesome uh, well with that we really appreciate your time dr isaacson uh, and thank you everyone else for attending in person and on zoom okay, cool. Thanks to you guys. I uh, appreciate all, uh, all you guys are doing. And uh, until next time, take care, guys. Thank you.